I wrote Simon a follow-up email. It was a great email. <laughs> it was, so okay. I now call it like a, like Let's a five paragraph it. email or a, a network with intent email. So what it is. Shad, welcome yes. to the show. Good to be here. Hello. Good to have you, man. Thank you. Uh, so as I, I, as I warned you, I'm going to dive straight into things. And I want to start off by asking you uh, how you ended up working directly with uh, Simon Sinek. The story sure. of how you ended up working with Simon Sinek. Sure. So I will say persistence, passion, and luck <laughs> is what I would say. And then sort of the story of how I started to work with Simon is I became quite disillusioned, if this is a word, I'm not sure if it is, unenamored, the opposite of enamored with my corporate career. On my first day of my first job coming out of school and into corporate life, a thousand people were let go on my first day. So I was walking in Damn. as many more were walking out. And I saw the impact of uncertainty and tumultuous culture, not just on people's productivity, but their well-being. And so I fell out of love with my career very early. It was in my early 20s. It was the first time in my life I made a choice and it wasn't working out. And the first person I made wrong was me. Like, what's wrong with me? And why is this not? Like, why am I unmotivated? And as opposed to you know, perhaps looking at the environment around me and maybe why this isn't the right environment for me, I first pointed at me. But fortunately, through reflection, through some mentorship, networking, I began to realize that maybe this isn't the right career path and setup for me. And it was a, a friend of mine, a guy by the name of James Powell, who sent me Simon Sinek's How Great Leaders Inspire Action TED Talk, which at the time probably had about two or three million views. It now has close to 60 million views. And I did what every good person would do is I procrastinated for about two months, didn't click the link, finally did. And I remember watching it and just being like, huh, everything this guy says to be true. I'm totally drawn in by his passion. And I just began profitalizing his, his message. I would share it with anyone who would listen. I would take out a sheet of paper or napkin, draw the circles, explain it. So that would have been, I was introduced to Simon's work in the summer of 2010. And in the fall of 2010, after I'd left that first job, I went to a conference in Toronto, where it is home for me. I went to a conference called The Art of Management to go hear Malcolm Gladwell speak because I was a big fan of Malcolm Gladwell, still am. Mm. And Simon spoke just before him, unbeknownst to me. Oh, wow. And it was so funny. I, I arrived very on time, meaning kind of late. And I sat down next to my friends who I was at the event with. And they, the like event promo magazine, they showed it to me. And they're like, that's your guy. Simon was on the cover of this event You were the magazine. Simon guy yeah, already. I was the Simon guy already. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. And so I heard him speak live. What I had, you know, felt watching him on a screen was amplified in person. I bumped into him and in, into the hall. I wrote him a message on his LinkedIn while he still responded to his LinkedIn some years later, I managed the team who responded to his messages on LinkedIn, and it was right time, right place. And I remember meeting his right hand, his CEO in Brooklyn some months later, and she said to me, you're going to do this with or without us, and we hope it's with us. And so it was right time, right place, building relationships, but Simon has clearly put into words of a more inspired, safe, and fulfilled world. I want to live in that world. I want to help advance more people feeling inspired, safe, and fulfilled by their everyday because I've felt the opposite at times in my life and career, and it ain't no fun. My cause is fulfillment. It's what I want for me. It's what I want for you. It's what I want for my kids. And so I feel very, very grateful that I've been able to devote my life and career to that work and that it's been with and alongside Simon for all these years. Wow. That's very cool. How did that conversation go when you crossed Simon's path at that conference the first time? What did you tell him? What did you guys talk about? It was very quick. So I asked him a question. It was a sea of people. There must have been some 1,200 or 1,500 people in this convention center hall. 
but I asked him a question. Ron Tight, who's become a friend, and Ron is the author of the book Think, Do, Say. Ron was the MC, and he looks a lot like Jeremy Piven, which is kind of funny. But he was the MC, <laughs> so he was walking around, and I, I remember I asked Simon a question because Simon gave the talk on Golden Circle and starting with why, that when we're clear in our why, disciplined in our hows, and consistent in what we do and who we are and what we say, people know who we are. And so I asked him, how do you ensure that you're being authentic or what are some tips and tricks and ways to test oneself if they're being authentic? And he spoke about symbols and having physical things that remind us of who we are and what we care about and keeping them around us and even on us. So at the time, Simon was wearing a belt that he was given from the US Air Force to remind him of service and the miracle of flight. He was wearing an orange watch because orange is the color of, of, of inspiration. So he had these physical things to both remind him and also give him an excuse to talk about the thing he, thing he cares about and believes. And so the, the things that I do now, I wear a green watch because green is the color of service. I wear this little bracelet that a family friend who's now all of 12 years old made for me and gave to me because I want to show up in a way that would make him proud. Like, that's why I wear this. Oh. You know, I have my my grandfather's initial ring that he gave to me on his deathbed literally a couple days before he passed away when I told him that we were pregnant. I'm getting chills as you're saying this. That's so I cool. was preg- we were pregnant with our firstborn, and we told him literally days before he passed away. Wow. And so then I bumped into Simon in the hall at the end of the event. I said, hey, I was the guy who asked you the question about authenticity, and he just said, you know, hey, nice to meet you. And he, he <laughs> wanted to give me one of these, which is a token of inspiration. Oh. So we hand these out to people who inspire us yes. and who are inspired by the movement to create a more inspired, safe, and fulfilled world. But he had run out of them, so he was going to give one to me, but he didn't have any. But years later, I ended up getting, maybe not even years, but some months or years later, I've acquired some from him and now hand out my own of those. That's very cool. It, it reminds me, of, I've never been, but like, it kind of makes me think of Burning Man in a way. Where it's kind of like a business card, but like way cooler, where you're like handing out this artifact that has like some meaning. Yeah. And it really, I feel like it probably makes an interaction stand out and just like, there's a, it carries a lot of meaning. To yeah, it. I love handing them out because like it, it has my name on it. There aren't many Steven Shedlevskis out in the world. So if I hand someone that, they can very easily track me down via Google. But yeah, it's really fun handing those out because it it means more than a business card, perhaps, especially with someone who's interested in and believes in what I believe in as well. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So at that conference, like had you already decided you wanted to work for him or at what point did that did that materialize in your mind? Great question. So at that conference, I didn't know that I wanted to work with or for him. I didn't know that it was even a possibility. All I knew was that I had found my order. Like all I knew at that point is I found a leader. I found someone that I wished to, I was choosing to follow. That's all I knew at that point. After I heard him. That mission kind of like lit you on fire. Like nothing had. Totally. And at that point I was all of not even 24. I was like 20, like I was almost 24 at that time, 23 and a half. I had one unsuccessful job that I hated and I was, I was lost, lost in the sense of I knew what I cared about, but there was a a gap or a dissonance between what I wanted to be doing and where I was. I kind of felt like Mm -hmm. I knew step 10, I knew the peak of the mountain, but I was very clearly at step one and I had no idea what steps two through nine were. So. I had found someone that I'm like, yes, like I want to be doing that. I want to be helping with that. I don't know exactly how I will do that. I think it's speaking. I think it's facilitating. I think it's coaching, but you know, and what do I know about leadership? I'm all of not even 24. After I heard Mm -hmm. him speak live, I kind of became obsessed and just started reading any article. I bought his book, listened to any podcast I could get my ears on. And I wrote a quick little article. I was managing a little blog at the time that I started called something around millennial engagement or something on LinkedIn. And so I wrote a little article just on him in the book and that I saw him live in the TED Talk and that I'm going to read this book and 
recommended others do it as well. And I sent him a note on LinkedIn and he responded to it within a reasonable-ish, you know, a reasonable amount of time, a couple of weeks or something. And he said to me, what, uh, what did the note say? Did you just share the article you had written or what was like the, the gist yeah, of- if I recall correctly, I reached out to him saying, Hey, I heard you speak live. I was the person who asked you this question. So inspired by your message. I wrote this little article, you know, here it is. I think I asked him to comment on it or join the group or something, which he didn't do. And I don't blame him. Okay. And I said, I'm going to read your book. To which he responded and said to me, I hope you enjoy the book more than the talk. To which I thought in my head, and maybe I even responded, I don't really like reading that much. So like unlikely, but thanks. Like I'll give it a whirl. And then, so I I didn't even tell you this. So I was fired from my first job at that first company, that post-merger company. And the reason I was fired was not because of my performance, it was because of my attitude. So I, I mentored a number of interns a disproportionate number of which turned down full-time job opportunities, citing conversations with this guy. And when senior leadership Mm -hmm. got word of this, I was gone. And it was the right call. I mean, I was toxic in what felt like a toxic culture. Like, it was not for me. I turned down a promotion. Like, it was not for me. So that makes you a good guy, right? Toxic. In a yeah, toxic if you're culture. toxic within a toxic, <laughs> like, I, I, it's kind of exactly. cancels out, right? Any any <laughs> negative multiplied by a negative is a positive. So there you go. Yeah. And then I had a career coach as an outplacement service. I was really exploring what did I want to do. I started doing some public speaking, mostly around overcoming fear. I grew up with a stutter and had become a decent public speaker, and so I started giving talks on overcoming oh, wow. fear and leadership. So I started doing a little bit of talks, a little bit of workshop, a little bit of coaching, but I had, you know, I was coaching people without any training or certification. So I found what I wanted Mm -hmm. to be doing, but it felt a little premature. I ended up taking a job at Ernst & Young doing change management consulting, which I'm glad I did it. I learned a lot. I learned how to be a better professional. I learned some skills. It wasn't for me long term. I tried actually trying to bring in Simon's ideas and philosophies internally to Ernst and Young at the time to try to help them engage and retain their millennial talent, to which they said, Yeah, maybe in a couple of years. And I went, Sayonara, like, no thanks. <laughs> and so at that point, so I remember I went on, I was unemployed and I went on. Uh, holiday vacations with my family and it felt weird to go on vacation when I didn't have employment it's just odd but I devoured any of Simon's stuff like I remember listening to some amazing podcasts and I was just like learning from him without him knowing that I was learning from him which was pretty cool read his book isn't that beautiful like you can have you can have a mentorship from anyone with like just all digital like mostly free material I mean, I learned how to help. But how, how old are you at this time? This would have been a month or two after I heard him speak live. So I was still not even 24. I was okay. 23 and a bit. Yeah. By listening to podcasts of him, I learned how to help others find and articulate their why, their purpose. And so I reached out to him again. I was just offered the job at Ernst & Young. I begrudgingly took it. It was the first time I felt opportunity cost because there are some things some momentum building in my speaking and facilitating and coaching stuff, but I kind of knew it was the right call. I ended up using the money that I was earning from Ernst & Young to fund my leadership coaching training. So I went and got certified as a leadership coach, which was great. And then in that time, I wrote Simon a follow-up email. It was a great email. (laughs) It was, so okay. I now call it like a, like Let's a five paragraph email or a, a network with intent email. So what it is, and I've written articles about this so we can link to anyone who's interested. It's, so let's okay. say I'm reaching out to you. I go, Jeremy, here's how we know each other. You know, we were introduced by Brian Wish. Here's why you inspire me. And if you get this right and they're legit, they'll keep reading. Um, because of said inspiration, here's what I'm inspired to do to help advance that. 
he, which, and if they're really legit and they care about service and more than their own ego, they're really going to keep reading. Then I go, here, here's how I make up you can help me, or here are the questions I have for you. Do you like coffee or drink any liquid, and can I buy you said liquid? Right? Do you have 15 minutes for a phone call? That's good. So it's that. And That's I've solid. used it many times, and it's sincere and genuine, and it works. Here's how we know each other, so it's yeah. not cold. Here's why you inspire me, what I'm inspired to do, how I make up the story, you can help me, can I buy you coffee? Yeah, and the beauty of that email is that you're not only telling them why they inspire you, but you're telling them that you've taken like some steps and that if they give you more advice, like that advice is going to be acted upon, right? That's like incentivizes them to like, oh, this is not just someone that's seeking advice for advice purpose, you know, just to be like, oh, I, I got a response from Simon Sinek, but it's like, oh, this guy is actually gonna implement the advice I give him and it's gonna have an impact. Totally, right? and it's like, as my own profile has begun to grow a little bit and my following has grown a little bit, I get a lot of these messages now and the number of them that are, can I pick your brain? And it's like, I don't want a lobotomy, by the way. Thanks very much. But like so many of them are very without effort, without research, yeah. with entitlement. Like I expect you. And I really appreciate it when someone reaches out with that, which by the way, I'm giving mm. everyone a playbook that if you ever want, to get my attention, do those things. And if I don't respond, I'm a fraud, you know? But yeah, yeah. To, to your point, Jeremy, it shows research, it shows intent, but it shows that I've become obsessed that a huge proportion of our success in our lives is in direct correlation with other people choosing to take risks on us. And so I've become obsessed mm -hmm. with what are the conditions I'm creating to make it as easy as possible for someone to want to take a risk on me could be someone hiring me, could be mm. someone accepting a job offer, could be a client, could be my kid. Like I'm obsessed with how do I create the conditions that people want to take a risk on me. And so I think an email like that, that is going, all right, I think this person is worth my time because to your point, I think they will advance what I care about. So what did, what did that email specifically look like for Simon? Like block by block, how did you fill, how did those, I fill uh, those up? Those four or five? Yeah, I could yeah. go and find the email, but off the top of my head, it was, we met each other at this conference. I'm totally inspired by the world you imagine of a more inspired, safe, and fulfilled world. Frankly, I've read your book. I've listened to everything that I can get my, my hands on, and I'm only more engaged. I'm trying to advance those things in my own work, in my consulting at Ernst & Young, in the way that I'm engaging with people through speaking, facilitating coaching. I really want to do that work. I feel like you would be an amazing mentor to me and can help, you know, reconcile some things in my head. Like I remember when I did end up speaking to him, I asked him, I had been given advice that if I wanted to do work in this space, I needed to get a PhD that didn't sit right with me. And I wanted to ask him that question of, do I need to be an expert, you know? To which mm -hmm. when I later spoke to him, he said, no, you don't need to be an expert. You need to care. You need to know enough. And anytime you don't know enough, ask an expert. That's when you find a PhD. Who knows? Oh. Like the research is out there. So that's what that email looked like. I asked him if he'd be willing to have a quick chat. And I heard back from him like immediately. Okay. I got an email back like right away. Surprising. I'm like, oh my God. And it was an autoresponder. <laughs> And it said, <laughs> and it said, I no longer respond to my professional email. If you'd like uh, to get a hold of someone for, you know, a corporate opportunity or speaking gig, it's Kim content, it's David and for scheduling it's Danielle. And I'm like, well, I don't think I'm audacious enough to try to pull that this is for like a paying, big paying corporate gig. I'm not going to write to, to Kim. That's just too much, but I'll write to David and. Danielle, you know, I could definitely write to the person who is in charge of his scheduling and it made sense to write to David as well. And so I wrote to the both of them. I heard back from Danielle probably a few days after saying, you know, hi, Stephen, every now and then we receive many emails and emails like yours. And I'm like, oh, I'm just another guy who deserve more than just a response. Yay. And she said, we want to set up a call between you and Simon. This would have been now, Jeremy, in January of 2011. 
I just started at Ernst & Young doing consulting there, and we had a call set up for February. I later got a response from David, like the next day, the other guy I wrote to, and both David and Danielle and mm-hmm. Kim, for that matter, are all still very close friends, especially David, David and Kim. And uh, David wrote back saying, like essentially saying no, like gatekeeping and blocking me out. And I felt like I was a kid in kindergarten who asked one teacher to go to the washroom and one said yes. And as I'm walking out, the other's like, no, you can't go. But I'm like, but Ms. Henderson said I could go. And so I like emailed them both back being like, look at Danielle's email below. Like she gave me the go ahead. So the conversation was booked for February. It got pushed out to March or April. And I remember having this conversation with him. I was at work. I went into my car and took the call in the parking lot. And the call was booked for maybe 30 minutes. We, we ended up going long. We spoke for 45. And it just so happened that, so I spoke to him, I think, on a Tuesday. And that Thursday, I was going to New York, where he was living at the time. And I said, you know, we were chatting along and probably... 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 20, I think it was about 20, 21 minutes into the call, I said to him, like, I'd be remiss if I didn't let you know, I'm coming to New York, like this week and this weekend, I would be so honored to buy you a coffee in person and continue the conversation. And he ended up inviting me to join him and his family at the MS walk. And I was when he first offered it to me, I was kind of overwhelmed by the offer and like I went to like my logistical brain of how am I going to do that and I haven't registered for the walk and I haven't raised any money and and I said no at first I said no and then we're wrapping up the call you're like I'm good we're we're wrapping up the call (laughs) he gave me the answer about the PhD you don't need a PhD you just if you need an expert's opinion ask one I asked him why it was either in this conversation or when I met him in person because I did end up meeting him in person I asked him why he took my call and he said I got the sense that you were a giver I got the sense that you weren't showing up for you that you were showing up to serve and advance my work that's why he took my call in line with that Mm. email that I wrote but just as we're hanging up I said hey remember you offered like 23 minutes ago that I could come join you and your family for the MS walk yeah can I do that still (laughs) and he's like yeah sure like get in touch with Danielle and like she'll set it up And so I was supposed to go to New York with my girlfriend. We had broken up. I took my brother and I went early morning, Saturday or Sunday morning. And I was supposed to meet them in a VIP area or something and they weren't there. And so I'm like scrambling, going crazy, trying to find them, trying to call Danielle. I end up meeting them on the walk. They were just like a little bit forward. I'm like running and like frantically searching, trying to find him. (laughs) And then I remember, so his sister calls him Frank Abagnale Jr. from Catch Me If You Can. Because Simon's like this guy, he's Uh like, I love space travel. I'm going to go work with NASA. And like, he works with NASA. And I had, I had heard that in a podcast or something. And so I finally caught up to him and I just like slowly rubbed up next to him. And I said, Mr. Abagnale, (laughs) (laughs) so so yeah so i met him i met his parents i met his sister sarah and it was yeah we had this amazing walk i spoke with him i spoke with his sister it was very cool and very sort of reminiscent of the future to come wow so before going into that deeper so first of all did he choose to have that call with you because like it seemed like the gate like there was danielle and forget the other and david it seems like they kind of said like yes this can happen But then he was like, oh, I chose to have the conversation because you're a giver. So did he end up like choosing to have that call? Like kind of like the sign off? I don't know for sure. Either Danielle looked at it and made a call or she ran it by him and said, yeah, let's do it. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Gotcha. And then, and then on that call, you specifically were asking about like whether you need a PhD or not. Is that, was that kind of like with the the topic of the call was about like did you guys talk about anything else? was it just like him answering a couple of your questions around this topic I mean it was, was it was a mentorship call? call like it was a call mm-hmm. on I really dig what you're doing I want to do it you know similar things for similar reasons I want to advance mm-hmm. your work in whatever way that I can how can I 
it was just, you know, one of yeah. these calls of how did you become who you've become and how might I be able to take some of those things for myself and do it too. So it was just completely a mentorship call and yeah. he was very gracious and wonderful and open in sharing. It always amazes me how the people that do those calls, they're like very selfless in it. And it's like, as the person on the other end, you're like, why? You know, why are you doing this? But like the people that give to that extent, it always ends up coming back, right? Like you ended up working with Simon, spoiler alert, for Still like in, 10 yeah. years. And it's like, that was just like, yeah, that was just from this one call that he accepted to take with like a random yeah. stranger that had some questions, right? So it's like, it always amazes me of like, oh, these small favors end up paying up. Paying yeah, but, it, but it's not the intent run. of why someone does it. The intent of why someone does it is because it's the right yeah. thing to do. It's been done for me. You know, yeah. it is a pay it forward. You know, I, I think Simon yeah. took the call for a couple of reasons. I think he felt as though I was worth investing in because I would help advance his vision of a more inspired, safe and fulfilled world. And I also think he did it because yeah. it had been done to him. You know, he's been very lucky to have amazing mentors in his life. And it's only right to mentor others that you feel called to mentor as well. And then I, I think to your point, I mean, and Adam Grant wrote a book on this called Give and Take, that when you show up to give, yeah. you end up generating loyalty. You have a favorable reciprocity style and people want to help givers. So yeah. Nice. So back to the walk, you just, it seemed like you're building a personal connection with him, his yes. family. Where so, do you think you go from there? I remember a few distinct things from that walk. He had just came back, I think from Cape Canaveral in Florida with NASA, which is cool. Mm -hmm. I remember he taught me one very specific thing and it ended up being, I subscribed to his notes to inspire, which are daily emails with quotes that he sends out. Ironically, I ended up running his notes to inspire for many years later, but he said to right. me at the time I was going through leadership coaching training and I was using some very coachy and polarizing language with him. And by polarizing, I mean, you know, preaching to the choir language. And he said to me, he said, simple ideas are easier to understand. Ideas that are easier to understand can be repeated and ideas that are repeated can change the world. And he said to me, if you talk like a scientist, scientists can understand you. But if you talk like a truck driver, not to insult truck drivers, but both scientists and truck drivers can yeah. understand you. And he taught me obsess yeah. with communicating in the most simple language possible. This is why people like Simon and Brene Brown are hugely popular. I mean, Brene is a great example of someone and Adam Grant. These are both PhDs who have been able yeah. to communicate, articulate their work, represent other people's works and studies in ways that can be accessible to a normal person who isn't an academic, which means it's useful. So he taught me that lesson on that walk. I remember handing him a card and I said, I wrote you a card in advance predicting why I'd be thankful for this conversation. And I, I think I was right. So here you go. And I gave him a card. And then I just stayed in touch with him and his team. I stayed in touch with Danielle. I stayed in touch with David. Uh, and there were some community calls that they were doing. So I would join those community calls. And I built, you know, a bit more relationship. And I just became known as a fan and a champion of the work. And then it was David, the guy who tried to gatekeep me out. He ended up inviting me. He had on his goals to create a podcast to create what, what we ended up calling the uh -huh. Start With Why podcast. We did 16 episodes, and it was all about trying to dive deeper into and have podcast conversations with guests, with Simon, to take the concepts from the book, Start With Why, and peel a few layers back and, and go deeper and just be a helpful resource and a practical resource for people to both understand and use the concepts more successfully. And so he asked me to do the podcast with him. I think he thought I was a bigger deal than I was because I was not a big deal. But I was like, oh my God, yeah. Like, 
opportunity to represent Simon and his work in the movement and to learn more. It was amazing. And so David and I did the podcast together. We had tons of fun and we complement each other very well and are still in touch and very close friends today. That's awesome. That's very cool. You must have been like pretty well spoken for him to make that offer, right? Like you weren't just like this kid that was just like yeah, mumbling. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm a fan. Yeah, I mean there must have been something. I want to unpack the I think the building a relationship phase is like crucial to going from a uh, fan to mm-hmm. we want you to work with us, right? That's kind of it's the same thing that happened with me at Impact Theory. I actually ended up, I interviewed with Tom and it didn't end up working the first time, but like one year later, like in the meanwhile, I was like keeping in touch with the team, like at trying to add value in all sorts of ways. And one year later, when they needed someone for this other business development internship, yeah. then I was the guy. So I want to elaborate a little more on that of, you said you were yeah. on community calls. How did that go? And like, how were you being intentional? Like, so, I mean, I said when we opened persistence, passion and luck. And I think it's still those three things. I mean, I wasn't doing it to get anything. I was showing up to community calls to learn, to contribute, to build relationship. And I was consistent and persistent. So to your point, when it came time for there to be an opportunity, I was atop their list of people that they asked, which was amazing. So I think case in point with what you did with Tom and and Impact is... You know, though you tried once and it didn't happen, you still kept trying and giving with good intent. And then when there was an opportunity, it was natural for them to ask you. So, so yeah, I mean, I, that was it exactly. They were hosting these community calls at the time. I would join them. I would ask thoughtful questions, but I wouldn't dominate. I connected with other members of the community for no other reason than to build relationship and see if we could help each other out. And it was awesome. It was awesome. So yeah, so David asked me to do the, the Start With My podcast because of how I showed up on those calls. Did you have the intention of getting a job there? When they offered um, you, was it a surprise? I, I mean, there were no job postings or opportunities. I'm sure I asked or someone asked and Simon gave the answer of we're all part of the same army. So whether you're doing it with or without me, we're all doing it, which is like, okay, cool. But can I do it with you? <laughs> <laughs> like great, 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 great. But yeah. so yeah, I mean, yeah, but yeah. that's true. I mean, Simon is truly building a yeah. movement. That's why he and the team continue to create tools yeah. and make them accessible. Because go use share, which is which is great. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think I knew. Like, I, there was no job posting or opportunity, so I was just hanging around and learning because I wanted to. So yeah. I left Ernst and Young after seven, eight months. Ironically, we ended up doing quite a bit of work with Ernst and Young later from Simon, and I ended up helping with it quite a bit, which was amazing. Funny how that works. <laughs> um, that it came full circle. So yeah, so Let's go. so yeah, I just hung around and contributed. I started doing more of my own coaching and speaking and facilitating again, and then got invited to join. And I mean, I kind of joke that I did my MBA by getting my leadership coaching training and certification and you know so I left Ernst and Young and then I convinced myself that I would if I just moved out of my parents home then I would be happy and I'm so happy I didn't do that because if I did Uh I would have put on golden handcuffs or velvet handcuffs and had to have stayed in a job because I now had a life to fund but because I had room and board covered thankfully yeah I say to my parents, which made it affordable for me to quit Ernst & Young at the time and start an entrepreneurial journey. And I remember after the first sort of six months, because I went out on my own, I wanted to do coaching and speaking and facilitating, stuff with Simon sort of began, but I remember a very frank conversation with my dad. And my dad isn't the most emotional person or the most effusive person. He's awesome. We have an amazing relationship. But I remember saying to him sort of like six months in where things weren't moving as quickly as I wanted them to or could, I said to him, what if I made the wrong call? Like, what if I, this isn't going as quick as I thought it was going to go? 
sort of as I naively thought it would go. And my dad said to me, give it two years. He said, anything you put your, your mind to, you've made happen, give it two years. And then it was right at the two year mark that mm. the podcast started to go. David Mead ended up becoming the first person outside of Simon who gave talks and did workshops on Simon's behalf that wasn't Simon. And so they needed someone to fill David's shoes. David was doing customer service, product development, and I became that person. And it was hard work. I felt as though I was sort of unfulfilled in the fulfillment company because I was contributing. <laughs> but I, I love that. I, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't contributing in the way I wanted to. But I feel like that's important to share because I feel like to get your foot in the door with anyone, you kind of have to start with that unfulfilling work. But that always leads to better things, right? Yeah, I, I don't think you have to start with that un, that unfulfilling work, but sometimes, like, you know, I'm a believer in passion and strength and organizational need. And at the time, yeah. the organization... Uh, so, like, when you're... If you're coming in... I'm not saying you didn't have any skills, but if you're coming in with no skills... Or no uh, experience. And something needs to be... Or no experience, and something needs to get done, like, that's your way in. Yeah. Right? Totally. And, and it's not going to be long term, right? It's going to be like a temporary thing. Yeah. And so uh, Kim, the, the previous CEO, said to me, hey, I got a crazy idea. I mean, Kim is so, she's so good. Individualization is one of her top strengths. So she's so good at being attuned to individual strengths and needs and putting people in positions to thrive. And she said to me, this is not going to be easy for you. She said, I'm gonna, like, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to do things like build better systems and processes, which aren't your strengths. I'm gonna ask you to do monotonous tasks, which is gonna make you bored. Like she said, this is not gonna be easy. If you want it, I'm willing to take a chance on you. She essentially hired me for a job that she knew I wouldn't be good at, but that I would bring something to. It was the right foot in the door. I almost quit, but then I made a decision. Uh, I almost joined and became a coach with Marcus Buckingham's or organization and his, he had some sort of coaching thing that I was introduced to and I ended up, I ended up saying no to it. And I just made a conscious effort to say, I want to make this work. And I said, I'm not, I'm not contributing in the way I want to contribute but I'm contributing and I can either choose to own my room in the house or abandon it. And I just chose to say, I'm just going to dig in. And even though it's hard, I'm just going to own it. Um, and it was when I made that choice and that shift, everything changed. Um, and they completely trusted me and they gave me more opportunity and, and responsibility and hired someone under me that I could lead and manage to do customer service on my team and everything just shifted once I said, listen, I'm not contributing in the way that I want to, but I'm contributing and I'm just going to choose to do it to the best of my ability. And things just like, like a miracle, um, totally transformed. That's huge. What, what do you think that that shifted? Like just that slight change in mindset. What, why, why did that change things? I brought a total different demeanor as opposed to resenting the work. I attempted to own the work. I mean, we were doing customer service at the time. Everything came into one email address. And then we ended up shifting to Zendesk, which we still use, use today, which is a great customer service email system. And, and that, that was your initiative? No, it was imposed upon me. Okay. It wasn't my idea. It was, it was the idea of our head of operations at the time. But I remember painstakingly going through like, so many emails to help sort through what's what to help create categories and but i was saved out of e email land and then started doing uh, i was the first person to do simon's social media who wasn't simon so i had a great opportunity to learn how he communicates and to try to communicate like him and it was the greatest compliment when i would put out a post and or comment and you know people thought that it was coming directly from him that was the best sort of test so yeah the shift was greater trust and again that obsession with create the conditions for people to want to take a risk on you 
Yeah, it's like when you're when you're willing to take on more, like people are just like, like actually when you get stuff done right and like and and it seems like you're happy with it, like people just put more stuff mm -hmm. on you and then give you the resources to thrive, right? The best way to do more great work is to do more great work, right? I love so, that. so yeah, it was just it was a shift of as opposed to dragging my feet, I made the choice to own it, even if it was hard, and it totally transformed everything and gave me so much opportunity to do to have this amazing thriving 10 plus years with them where was simon when you started with him like where was he on his career and path to like i don't know influencer uh thought leader i think is maybe a better word yeah i mean <clears throat> when i joined him uh i was the fourth person to join his team start with why i had been out and I'm trying to think, I don't think he, he had even started writing Leaders Eat Last uh, at all. So it was pretty early days. I think what, Start With Why came out in 2008, 2000, yeah, I think 2008, and I joined him in 2011. So it was pretty early days. I think when I joined him, though, his, his TED Talk was amongst, I think it was the second most watched TED Talk at the time when I joined him. It was already big. It was already, then. yeah, it was already big. <laughs> and now it's, now it's the number one, right? <laughs> now it's actually, I think, is number it? three. Sir Ken Robinson is number oh, one. Okay. Amy Cuddy, number two, maybe. I, it's um, definitely top it's five, I think, still. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. One thing I wanted to talk with you about is I think something that uh, Simon and the whole team are world class at is like taking an idea and turning it into a movement, right? And I think there's a difference between like writing a book and then enacting the vision of that book as a business and like creating an organization that's enacting that mission like in mm -hmm. the long term, right? So I wanted to hear your thoughts on that and how you guys have done that like at Ignite and um, wh why you think that's important uh, to actually get like a mission accomplished. So part of the issue is it's hard for me to to taste the water I swim in, meaning I've just been involved with this so much that for me, it's like, well, why would you do it any other way? <laughs> but I think, I mean, a few things. So, and I have, um, so Seth, Seth Godin in his book, Tribes, wrote this, which is brilliant. So a leader can increase the effectiveness of the tribe and its members by, one, transforming the shared interest into a passionate goal and desire for change which I think Simon does very well. This is vision saying status quo, where we want to go, right? Simon is very good at articulating, sort of painting a clear picture on the... Like the world that could be, like the world we are in and the yeah, world that could be. Nancy Duarte has an amazing TED Talk on this where she dissected the anatomy of the most inspiring talks. And they all do that. They go from, here's the current status here's where we want to go, current status, where we want to go. Um, and so I think Simon does that really well. So that's one, transforming the shared interest into a passionate goal and desire for change. Two is providing tools to allow members to tighten their communications. So then how do you make it easier for other people? The movement doesn't belong to the order or the leaders. The movement belongs to the people who join the movement and say, I'm a part of this and you want to help advance it. And quite frankly, the global pandemic, though its atrocities, did us favors with this. Our previous business model at Simon was more so catered toward, like we, we tried to do public stuff. We had social media and YouTube channels and tools you know, we, we tried to do as much as we could to make the movement accessible and to give tools into people's hands. But unless your organization or conference brought Simon or one of our team members to an event, it was kind of hard to engage with us. And there we, we sort of never really meaningfully cracked the code on community. Um, when the pandemic happened, what we decided to do was all of the like our b2b business literally disappeared it was it was pretty well gone um it began to come back 
April, May, June, you know, it began, began to, to come back and it was all virtual. And just to clarify, like that's Simon or members of the team, like going to companies to give a talk on like how they can implement theories from Simon's book, like within exactly, their organizations, yeah. it's, it's right? It's keynotes, Q and A's, workshops, trainings on Simon's content, um, on Start With Why, Leaders Eat Last, in Infinite Game. And so the pandemic came and all that business disappeared. And so what we decided to do was we said, hey, there's tons of fans and people who love our work. Why not create live online experiences? Because we're good at live and anyone around the world can sign up and take classes. And so we actually began to form community and people who would show up to these classes began forming their own groups and sub-tribes. It was really cool. So in some respects, not in some respects, in many respects, the pandemic actually allowed us to more meaningfully build community and allow members of the tribe and of the, of the movement to build relationship with each other, which has been awesome. Yeah. That's and then very the cool. last is, so desire for change, tools to enable communication, and then leveraging the tribe to allow it to grow and gain new members. So that's how Seth Godin talks about... It was like virality. Of vi virality. I mean, if it's that Derek Sivers uh, TED Talk, if you've seen that four or five minute talk of the, of the wacky guy dancing at a, an outdoor amphitheater concert, the festival, like and festival like one guy like runs over, almost, almost if not completely mockingly, like says to his friends, check this out and goes and dances just as crazy as the, as the crazy dancer and the crazy dancer embraces him and hugs him. Right. And then there's a third person who comes and within literally a minute, there are thousands of people dancing because one lone nut chose to embrace the first follower. Right. And the first followers are a that. form of leadership. Yeah. Right. And so Simon yeah. has devoted his life and career to the law of diffusion of innovation, which is the first two and a half percent of a population are your innovators. Then you have your early adopters, which is the next 13 and a half percent. Then you have your early majority, late majority and laggards. And so he's just become obsessed mm -hmm. with finding people who believe in the cause, who want to advance it, who don't need to know all the dats and stata, dats and stats and data and figures, and who just believe it and who believe that you know, that the responsibility of business is to advance a purpose, protect people, and generate profit in that order. And he's become so obsessed with, with finding champions and supporting and enabling those, those champions. And that's leadership, right? Yeah, it's leadership, it's consistency. And yeah, it's been, it's been really cool as the organization has been built we develop products and services and offerings, we religiously followed anything we would do. We would say, is this advancing the cause? Is this advancing the movement? You know, And if the answer was, was yes, we would do everything in our power to do it and to do it well. It's a fun sort of when you write this book that gives concepts and models that can lead to greater inspiration, success, yeah. and fulfillment to get to use them. It was totally gratifying and yeah. cool. It's very interesting because <clears throat> like most companies start with like a product or something like that. And then they try to, I mean, not to say that that's everyone, but like then they try to slap a mission onto the product to kind of like, to kind of guide people. And that's, uh, maybe, maybe that's not the case. Maybe it starts with the mission and the product comes. But like what was interesting here with, uh, with Simon is like, it's like literally like writing the culture Bible, like start with why. And I mean, all mm -hmm. the other books that he's written and then using those as the i mean the gospel that just set the, the the mission for the entire movement right totally it's almost like every company should write a book like that about what they believe to inspire everyone that that works there yeah i mean it's why the bible exists by the way it's it's a tangible thing <laughs> yeah. that when you don't know who you yeah. are and you need a reminder you go back to written word and it doesn't need to be just in scripture um it can be videos it can be podcasts it can be any form of communication it's stories, it's fables, it's an origin story. It can be written, it can be spoken, um, it can be video, it can, you know, all different formats to remind us this is who we are, this is how we make 
decisions. This is what we stand for. And then have the courage to do it. And those things are kind of the second thing that you mentioned, like the tools that enable the people that are part of the movements to spread. To spread the totally, word, right? totally. But yeah, when you see organizations who take a product and then back into a mission from the product, that's called manipulation. Right? That's yeah. performative. It's just to sell more stuff. Yeah. Um, and in order yeah. for this stuff to be real, it must be lived from the inside out of the company. Right? Here's a Simon quote, no customers will love a company until the employees love it first. So, you know, our belief, and we've seen it, that great organizations stand to solve and meet a need, a human need, a need that's out in the world, and they obsess about doing it internally to the culture and for each other, which is the best way for it to, to bleed out and ooze out to the end user, right? Organizations exist to serve an end user, of course, but leaders must exist to serve their people. When leaders serve their people, their people serve each other, and that always gets out to the end user or customer, which then takes care of the results and the shareholder or whatever it might be. That's the right. order. So your role within the company, um, we, we kind of stopped that you were uh, kind of managing the social media for yep. Simon. I mean, you've been there for like almost 11 years now. Uh, how, how did that role evolve? Like what, what was the, what were the next steps and what did that growth, personal growth and professional growth within the organization look like for you? Yeah. So did the podcast, did customer service, customer service volume increased so much. We brought in Zendesk, had another person on the team. I led them it, sort of, it, it's sort of one of the places where a lot of people start in the company is in customer service now because they learn the products and the message. And so, I was involved with the customer service team or movement support team for many years. And it was really fun sort of helping and teaching people how to communicate in our message. Made tons of macros galore. I'm sure some of them are still used in some way, shape, or form today, which is fun. Started doing social media. Started doing product development as well. I probably had too much on my plate. And, you know, we parsed my role and picked it apart and, and divvied it up and gave people other things on things that I couldn't, you know, manage and lead on, on my own. I started doing quite a bit of speaking and facilitating, um, at events and with clients, keynotes and workshops as well, which I love doing. And then a, an opportunity came up where our, uh, CEO at the time, Kim really, you know, the organization needed more communication, more dissemination of information, more transparency, which are things that I naturally do and love. I mean, communicator is my top strength. And she needed a chief of staff. And I raised my hand and I said, I think I can do it. Uh, and so I became uh, chief of staff for a good, a good chunk of time, which was a blast. Um, I really enjoyed it. And I partnered with, with the CEO and really helped her plug holes and communicate, had the opportunity to narrate uh, Find Your Why, which was Simon wrote Start With Why, Then Leaders Eat Last, Together Is Better, which is a sort of, you know, coffee table book, quote book, kind of like comic book type of thing. And then we wrote Find Your Why, which is a practical guide. It's like Kill Bill Volume 1 and Kill Bill Volume 2. So Kill Bill Volume 1 was, was Start With Why, which is a manifesto. Volume two, find your why, was a more practical guide. So you want to find your why as, as an individual team or organization, here's the book. And I worked on that book and helped, helped develop it and, and write pieces of it, and then had the chance to, uh, to narrate that book as the audiobook narrator, which was a ton of fun. Yeah, and then head up product development and training and led um, our speakers and, and facilitators, our team of global speakers and facilitators. And now I'm still doing speaking and, and facilitating with them. So I've stepped away from, from the internal role. It was it was the right time to, to sort of step away from that and let other people take the charge and lead that, of which I'm pleased to support them from the, from the sidelines a bit more now. And still doing speaking and facilitating uh, with them, which is just, I love it. It's so much fun to find people who care about this message as much as I do and who are doing it and who are providing environments for their people that aren't perfect, but they're working so hard at it. And it's such gratifying, awesome work to 
work with and support leaders who care about creating this world and who are partners with us trying to advance and literally change change the, the face and the experience of work, making it more inspiring, more safe and more fulfilling. Seems like it, it's come full circle, right? Like you started off like before joining Simon as a speaker, but didn't really have like a, didn't feel like you had the experience or like a strong like mission to kind of drive you in your, in your speaking and coaching. And now like after kind of like being behind the scenes with Simon for like over 10 years, uh, I mean, you started speaking like a couple of years ago, but like now really have like a true mission that like, that you feel like you can share and, 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 uh, disseminate through your speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Which is ton. I mean, I, I've been doing the speaking with Simon for close to eight years now. Wow. Um, but it's, you know, but I started doing it when I, when I was in my like mid to late twenties for like tons of imposter <laughs> syndrome. Um, and not that that doesn't creep up every, every now and then still, but, uh, but yeah, you're totally right. Being able to do it now. I mean, yeah, I love the message. Place, it seems like, yeah. 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 It comes from a more grounded experience place and it's been fun. You know, I haven't just had a chance to talk about it. I've had a chance to live it internally within an organization as well and, and help it be yeah. brought to life. So, you know, I'm not just preaching about it. I, I can share stories internally to the organization with other clients of, of when it's, you know, not gone well and when it has gone well as well. Because you, we learn from both. If anything, we learn more from when it doesn't go well. 100%. Yeah. And now you're, you're working on your own book as well in parallel. Uh, can you talk about a little bit about that and where that desire came from? Um, sure. And a little more about the book. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I was always open to writing my own book, but I made a rule, which was I'll only do it if I find something worth writing about or come across something that's worth writing about. Because I've seen many speakers write books because that's what keynote speakers do, which is the definition of a shitty book. And I didn't, I didn't want that. And so... Just through my own fascination and passion for what Amy Edmondson calls psychological safety and just noticing what I gravitated toward in terms of the stuff that I was consuming most, reflecting on my own experiences of being parts of teams and organizations and relationships where there either was a lot of, of, um, of candor, right? So uh, a, a psychologically safe, environment is one in which we can share warts and all share ideas even if they're half-baked talk about concerns like i'm not trained for this job or i'm having trouble at home and it's affecting my, my work you know i i'm concerned about this project it's going to be over budget over time there's a safety concern here and even disagree you know no leader i i, I don't see it the way that you see it i see it differently can we have that conversation and all of those are rewarded that's a psychologically safe culture. Now, Simon's taught me a Zig Ziglar quote, which is people don't buy drills, they buy holes. Psychological safety is the drill to get us a speak up culture as the output as a whole. And so a speak up culture is one in which there's high candor, low fear, not no fear, but low fear. Um, I don't believe in fearless, like people who say, here's our fearless leader. Fearless leader, I've never met one, right? Fear is actually really important. If it weren't for fear, we wouldn't need courage. And so I sort of came up with this idea last, last summer of speak up culture, that, I, that we need more speak up cultures. And just because someone speaks up doesn't mean that it's the truth, but it's their truth. And the great leaders among us spend the time to listen, acknowledge, encourage, and reward people when they do speak up. Because if we create Here's an Andy Stanley quote, which I love, that leaders who do not listen will eventually be surrounded by people who have nothing to say. And that silence is dangerous. You know, at its most innocuous, you miss opportunities. At its most devastating, it can be deadly. Um, and we've seen this with the Nassau Challenger disaster, with the Boeing 737 MAX 8 tragedies. These are documented speak-up culture issues where people knew that things were going to go wrong and they tried to express it and they weren't heard. Yeah, I'm writing that person speaking up might not have the truth, but that 
that's like that belief that they have might lead to the truth through the conversation right yeah, or it's very, I mean, in the cases of the NASA Challenger disaster and the Boeing 737 MAX 8, there was just too much time and financial pressure that it became blind, the culture became blind to it, inconvenienced by it, that it that it got in the way of profit making to acknowledge those truths, and they were dismissed. So it wasn't even just opinion, like there was data and fact and you know, in the cases of the 737 Max 8, there was a uh, a senior uh, manager who's a retired naval officer by the name of Ed Pearson, who literally spoke up to the general manager of the Renton factory that made the 737 Max 8 and said that he's seen operations in the military shut down for less, and that he felt unsafe putting his family on a Boeing airplane to which the GM of the Renton facility said, this is not the military, this is a for-profit or organization. Wow. <laughs> so, so yeah, so speak up cultures matter a lot, and, and they matter even if you are in a line of work that isn't surgery or aerospace, you know? We know from Gallup and the National Institute of Health that our relationship with our boss has more of an impact on our health than that of our relationship with our family doctor. So if you are a leader, you are in, you're in the business of being either health giving or health depleting. That's crazy. That, that, that you said that's a stat from Gallup? Gallup and the National Institute of, of Health, yes. Wow, yeah. that's, I've never heard that, that's really, I mean, both uh, inspiring and scary. <laughs> but I mean, but we can all reflect on it. We've all had a leader yeah. that made us yeah. love ourselves, love our life, love our job, you know, love an organization, love them more. And we've all had yeah. leaders that have made us worse. Percent. Right. And so leadership is leadership can be a killer. I call that leader shit um, or leadership <laughs> can be a life giver. Like leadership can be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah. I want more wonderful leaders. So just trying to do my part to help make more. Before I ask my last questions, where can uh, people find you and um, kind of stay, stay in tune with what's going on with the book? I know it's, you, you mentioned before we started, um, it's not coming out until fall of 2023, right? Correct, um, yes. So where, where can people stay up to date on that? Yeah, I'll try to see if we can get it out sooner, but that's the current uh, projected timeline. Yeah, we've drafted about three and a half chapters now and more to come. But people can follow along. Uh, I believe I'm the only Stephen Shudletsky in the entire world. So if you, uh, <laughs> this is a reminder for all you handfuls of Shudletskys out there, kindly don't name anyone, Stephen. Um, but if you Google me, you will find me very active on LinkedIn. And my website is shedinspires.com. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so to wrap up, I have a couple questions to wrap up, but like yeah. uh, the fir first of which is, what are the biggest lessons you've learned from Simon, and and how have they impacted you? Um, great question. The biggest lessons I've learned from Simon, one is talk less, say more, which is particularly as an extroverted, more verbose person and someone who likes to speak to 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 think. It can be my natural propensity to drone on. And Simon has taught me through uh, a mentor who taught him that three quarters of an answer is better than an answer and a half. And so I try to give, I'd rather give a three quarter of an answer than an answer and a half. So I think that's, that's probably the biggest thing that he's taught me is how, how to communicate in a way that is most likely to lead you to influencing others for the better. Nice. Yeah. Did you have any any other ones? Or I mean, I I know there's probably a million, but like we can we can leave it at that if you if you want to. I I mean that's been the biggest one. I mean the the other is just so S Simon has helped cement it in within me that and I've learned this from Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, um, uh, which is a great book, and for anyone who wants to live and lead a life of purpose, it's kind of a required reading is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. But Simon's really taught me as well that. The two most powerful human forces are hope and each other. If we have hope, if we have optimism, if we if, if we believe that tomorrow can be better, 
even if we're in a dark tunnel and we can't yet see the light, that we know that there's a light out there. If we don't feel that, phone a friend who can help you find and feel that. And then if we have each other, we kind of have, every, kind of have everything we need. Um, that as individuals, we're junk, but together we're remarkable. And, you know, Simon's on this quest as well, that life is about relationships, about nurturing quality relationships. And, um, yeah, he's taught me about hope and he's taught me about each other and relationships. That's beautiful. For someone who is kind of feeling lost uh, as far as, like, career-wise and, like, knows they have, like, some fire in them but haven't really found a way to express that, yeah. it seems like the path you found is finding someone else whose mission and vision you resonated with mm -hmm. and like going and joining that. Is that the path you would recommend for um, someone who is in that position of like not knowing what they do and um, what advice would you have for that person? So for that person, I think there's a couple of things. One is look inside and look outside. So one is to more specifically identify what is that fire and what does light you up and one of the the you know this is this is finding one's why this is finding purpose and the way to do it is to actually look to your past so our why our purpose is an origin story it's who we are and who we are comes from from our past and we look at the meaningful moments the peaks and valleys the times when things were awesome and the times when things were awful uh, because in both of those polars our values and beliefs, what we care about most, are, are revealed. Now, the, the 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 kicker to this is it's hard to go on that journey on your own because, as a friend of mine likes to say, it's very hard to read the label on the jar when you're stuck inside the jar yourself. And so this is like where that. it's very valuable to work with an objective partner to walk through, okay, these are the times I've felt happy and fulfilled and proud. These are the times that I've really struggled, that bad boss, that hard project, being bullied, losing a loved one, right? And it's through those peaks and valleys and sharing those stories with another objective listener that there are some common patterns and themes that emerge. That's the makeup of your passion, right? Passion is an output mm -hmm. when we're doing things with our strengths and contributing towards something bigger than ourselves than we care about, the result is fulfillment, the result is passion. And so for so many people who say, I wanna make a bigger impact, you know, I wanna do things that are more in line with my passion, well, great, what is your passion? What's the type of impact you wanna make? And then I'm a big fan of just experiencing, like if you don't yet know that, you know, don't wait for the perfect job because I don't believe it exists and just get some experience because you'll you'll learn like so much of learning what you do like is also experiencing what you don't like so just experience and get some experience and then on the external pieces look to people who inspire you whether they're well-known famous you know ce celebrities or moguls or, or not you know um, but find people that you look to them and you're inspired by them and you want you want some of what they have and see if they're willing to nurture, support, and, and help. You know, like if you said to me, you want to become a, a veterinarian, I'd be like, have, have you shadowed any? Do you know any? Like, go check it out before you invest your entire life in it, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I think shadowing yeah, yeah. And, and searching for, for, for mentors um, really, again, helps to create the conditions where people will teach us, people will want to take a risk on us. Awesome. I think that's a great place to end. Um, thanks so much, Shed. Uh, this was uh, very enlightening uh, for me, and I hope it will uh, inspire others to follow a similar path. Cool. My total pleasure, a treat to do this. And uh, yeah, hope it does help your listeners. Thanks for the opportunity. There you have it. I hope you got something out of this interview. I'm really trying to make this as valuable as possible to you. So if you have any feedback on how I can make this better, or if you have any questions for me personally, I'll get back to you. Uh, reach out to me on Instagram. My handle is at Jeremy John Mary. You can also comment if you're watching on YouTube. You can just comment below. All right, thanks for listening and have an epic week.